All right, man. Yeah, we're yeah. We're excited, man. We get another episode with our very good friend, Chencho. I'm joined yes. once again, like always, by Dave. We're pumped up, man. We're pumped up to be talking about the Oklahoma City Thunder. Dave, how are you doing this morning? Man, I'm doing great. It's great to have Chencho on the show again. Uh, we wanted to make sure that uh, people got a chance to hear Chencho this time. And, you know, we're all about sharing the mic. And Chencho, I'm glad you're here again with us. Uh, thank you, guys. I'm sorry for the problems, but I think the, it's going to be solved by now no. with these uh, new headphones. You bought me, so thank you for everything. And I cannot, I cannot express express with words how much I... Hey, we're excited, man. I love you guys. Tell me too. Oh. We love you, man. Well, and no matter no matter how much the, um, the audio was a little bit off last time, it wasn't as bad as it was when Chencho first started listening to Dave and I. We could <laughs> not be heard. We were talking in the worst way possible. Like, I, I don't even want to explain it. I just want to tell everybody, Chencho is the man when he first started telling us like hey you guys are on to something we actually thought we might be a little bit crazy right because we were like sitting there and we felt like we were just like talking to each other and we were sharing that conversation and then next thing you know we started seeing like this really catch on like a movement it was like wildfire and we, we basically were able to to change the language that people were using around the thunder in, inside the media outside the organization there's still a little bit of issue around the rest of the league, but people don't say tanking with the Thunder anymore, and we love it. We appreciate that. We appreciate the, uh, the maturation, but there's so much that goes back into what we've watched over the last couple of years take place. One of the greatest turnarounds in NBA history when you're talking about moving on from a, a team where we saw the other day we talked about Damian Lillard really say mm. goodbye to that generation of the Thunder, and here we are, and we're so good, so young, man. I love watching this team play. Um, we could talk about every player, but right now, let's give Trey Mann his props for one of his best games he's ever played. But that dunk, I mean, I, what the hell was that? It's, <laughs> you see one every now and then from Trey, and you're like, oh, my gosh. If he could put it together, he's starting to. But if he puts together his use of athleticism and his shot at the same time, I'm like, I don't, I can't compare him to a player. I don't want to do it. Never mind. Well, think about it. He almost did it the game before. You know, he got fouled in the game before, and he almost threw it down. And it was like, oh, my gosh. But this game, he wasn't going to be denied. And he knew he was going against a rookie, and he knew he was going to be able to throw it down against a rookie. And he just took advantage of that. It was good because we were having a horrible, horrible time with Mason Plumley and Williams last night. Uh, they got a combined eight offensive rebounds, yeah, Mark 31 Williams points. And it was just hard because we miss Poku. We miss Poku. And one of the reasons I'm bringing up Poku right now is when we first started talking positive about Poku and really giving love towards Poku, Chencho was one of the first people that agreed with us. Everybody else is like, oh, man, Poku needs to be forgotten. He needs to be left behind. We need to move on from Poku. And Chencho and us were the voice that were, like, driving the whole Poku, keep Poku, mentor this young man. He's going to be good. He's going to be great. And it's just great to have somebody – you know, uh, on the show yet again, that understands the game in, in such a way that that recognizes game. And when you see it in a young player, it's worth it to keep it and see what you can do with it. So it was it was hard to see uh, what life is going to be without Poku for the next, you know, couple months. Um, but with that being said, is there's a lot of places that we can move and we can get better on. And I, I look at Mike Muscala's uh, 19 minutes. Um, they're OK. Uh, we have younger guys out there that you know, this team is really built around our, our centers as, as holding up that, that foundation block, you know, you've got Chet, you've got Poku, you know, and these are our seven footers, man. And you take them out. Of course, we're going to have a, a stutter time. Of course, we're going to have trouble finding out how to uh, uh, play defense, um, not having these guys out there. So for me, I'm looking at this and I'm saying uh, this was a rough game, but there's so many great things, and I'm going to throw this over to Chentro in a second here, but you have Shea, 28, Giddy, 21, Dort, 22, J-Dub with his, like, what, fifth game in a row with double figures? He had 15 points. These are big, and I, I keep on looking at this and saying, like, this is a, a big moment for those guys, and you throw in Trey Mann. We have five guys with 15 or more points. That's great. That's what we need to see. 
it just was the bench that that kind of felt like I felt like was a lackluster last night, and that has nothing to do with anything else other than there was just some matchups that were were bringing us great difficulties, and that's just the way it goes sometimes. And for me, I see that. But Tencho, last night, what did you see in the game that mm-hmm. that kind of cost us what I would consider a, another good win? I mean, we have no center, so. I think we make uh, we made Mark Williams look better than he is right now. Of course, he can be a good <laughs> player in a couple of three years, but I think our lack of size and physicality under the rim cost us a lot of points, a lot of rebounds, and and easy baskets. Because I have a tweet on <laughs> here that I saw. And this morning that the Hornets were the most blocked team of, on the NBA. But I think yesterday we ended we did. up giving up 66 um, points in the paint to the, the Hornets. So I yeah. think we lost Chencho there, but um, I'm not, I think that's where he was going. Hey. Oh, so you're, you're back. Can you hear me? <laughs> go ahead, Chencho. Yeah, go ahead. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think like I saw a, a tweet that said that the Hornets were the most blocked team in the NBA with six and a half times per game. And yesterday, we only blocked one one time. So I think that sums up very much what what happened yesterday. We look, we make Mark Williams look like maybe Dwight, Dwight Howard uh, of the bench. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, he did. I mean, he was making big plays. He really, he impressed me. I think he could have a good future, but like you're saying, it's really hard to tell if he's as good as he looked because of, you know, we didn't have Poku out there. And I think that's kind of what you're getting at, Chencho, right? Is that like, we really miss Poku, just like Dave said. Yeah. And if we, if we don't play basically even more, I think, I think uh, as much as I, as we like Muscala, he's not a defensive presence. He's tall, he's big, but he has no youth and legs that can jump very high. And that uh, that's a thing that you can that you look you can watch it clearly on the on the TV. He is big, but Mark William is young and he can jump very high, and every other Hornets player, they can drive very easily at him or at whoever was at the center. I don't know. Maybe it was Jalen Williams that he was not. A, he did not a, a great game. So maybe that's because he he wasn't playing that much because he's still developing on defense. And him and Muscala were not enough. Or yeah. clearly not, well, not enough I definitely think. Them. Um, even though Jalen Williams or Jay Will, as we call him from Arkansas, he started and it wasn't like his best game by any means, right? There's a lot of pressure no. on starting. And um, But I was just really impressed with Coach for going with him. I, I think, like you said, Chencho, like we had Baisley. We didn't play him. It was a um, DNP coach's decision. And that, you know, doesn't look great for Baisley, but we've seen him go through that before. I had noticed – you know, when he went through it before, he really was able to pick up his effort. And I think that's what they're looking for is trying to get, you know, increase in effort from him um, when he's out there. But I'm not exactly sure. We'll we'll see how it how it works over time. But right now, yeah, like it took some, we'll call them big kahunas from coach to say, hey, we're going to go with Jay Will. And I think that this game, even though it wasn't a great game, could be a really big building block for his future because, Sure. Those minutes are important for a young player. He's been working his ass off in the G League. Yeah, and, yeah, it, and I think that's why he it, got those minutes. Uh, I, I think you have to look at it as Jay Will um, and Oz, Ozman and ahead, Ozman Chencho. Jang have been uh, playing well in the G League. And I think that's the one thing that you have to look at. With Ozman Jang, he's injured, but Jay Will came up. You've got Trey Mann that stepped up, and now you've got these guys that are really playing well right now. So that's what I'm looking at. Can you hear me? Absolutely, man. Well, 
I think there's a little bit of a, a delay in this connection, but that happens when you're talking to somebody who's on the other side of the world sometimes. And we appreciate everybody, you know, <laughs> joining us. Um, we know we got a little, we got a little feedback from some people on the YouTube, on the YouTube comments. And they were saying that they didn't appreciate all of our, our, our fun that we have on this show sometimes. <laughs> so we want to just let everybody know this is the time of the service where the children are allowed to leave. If you're not going to be a grown up, that's fine. Um, but, but this is a grown up show. This is for um, this is for people who like to have a lot of fun. And you know, when you go through the last couple of years, we have with a um, a team that's been rebuilding, and, and you're looking for the small things, right? You're looking for the little bit of growth that can you can extrapolate and say, okay, you know, play this for three, four, five, six years. Where does this look? Because for us, it's a community of people, you know that love the Oklahoma City Thunder from all over the place. We're not just from Oklahoma City, but some of us are, and some of us don't live there, and some of us do, right? So we want to look at the little things. You know, what are the what are the things that, that are big deal? So <clears throat> with Poku, his absence, 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 yeah, whatever. Who cares? My words Ab- are not right, but <laughs> absence. We'll take but, absence. No, his, his, <laughs> what, him not being there, to me, shows his value. In a way that him being there doesn't. Do you know what I mean? Like, mm. I, I feel like mm. we've gotten used to his production, and then all of a sudden you see this glaring hole in the middle, and we'd seen small small instances of it. But one thing we haven't talked about, Dave, is Poku's injury seems to be less serious than at first initially feared, although it is a serious injury, and it's going to take some time for recovery. So why don't we fill everybody in on that, and then um, I'll let you take it from there because – I I already said the, the the part I was planning about letting the kids go. Yeah, yeah. Well, I I, I think it's the most important thing that we have to look at is it's, there's no torn ligaments, there's no uh, ACL tears, there's nothing else like that. Um, that's really important when it coming to a, a knee injury. Um, you know, and when push comes to shove, you have what I would consider a very young, talented player. And let's just put this in perspective: Mike Williams, who plays center uh, for the Charlotte Hornets. He's 10 days, and he's a rookie. He's 10 days older than Poku, all right? Wow. Wow. So it, it kind of puts it in perspective. Um, when you have a young player like this, and he goes out, and which easily could have been a very torn ACL, uh, MCL, so many ligaments in the knee, he comes out of it, I mean, with, with yes, a broken bone um, and a, a fracture, um, a bone spur, whatever you want to call it in that, in that knee. Um, listen, it's going to take time. Okay, but, and, but let's just talk about it real quick because because you have a little information on this from a prior experience, right? Like, let's talk about this. The difference between a bone fracture and a torn ligament. Now, most of the time, a bone fracture sounds like a pretty shitty deal, but a torn ligament in the knee can take a whole year yeah. to recover from. Mm. Oh, I mean, not just a year to recover from. I mean, you're talking about <clears> like <throat> it, it, when I tore my first time I tore my ACL, it took me. Um, Five months to recover. I was back in five months, right? And this is Chencho's right. specialty too. So you guys are both qualified to mm. talk. <laughs> yeah, and I was back in five months, but I was not back in good shape for almost a year. <clears throat> I mean, and that's the way it went. Now, when I was in, you know, my thirties, I tore my ACL again. Like it took me almost two years to get back to the place I was before <laughs> I tore it. And of course, I, I, I've retorn it since, but I'm not having a surgery on my third ACL. Just not. I mean, like, I'm a 38-year-old man that doesn't run anymore, so there's no reason for me to go out and get ACL yeah. surgery. So with that being said, as, as you look at it, and, and when a young man goes out there and hurts himself, right, and he doesn't tear ligaments, and he doesn't tear this, he doesn't tear that, and that's what it could have turned into very easily. But because I believe the way the Thunder have been playing and taking care of these guys, and they're not tired – they're they're well rested. They have um, what I would consider strength coaches that are top of top in the world. And now you're putting these guys out there, and and they're prepared for a position, a, a something crazy like this to happen. Instead of having ACL, MCL, and a freak accident here with Poku, you get a broken bone. How does that happen? Well, that's because you're taking care of your assets. You're taking care of your young players. And that's what's so important is that you're seeing this team truly care about their young assets and young players, whereas you've seen other teams like, you know, Golden State or uh, the Knicks that will put players out there. And you're watching it right now with um, Sacramento. 
you know, they put Sabonis out there. He has a broken thumb. He's playing with a broken thumb. I was like, look how strong and mentally great he is. Yes, you're right. But it's a thumb. Why would you fuck around with a thumb? You know, like a thumb is so much of rebounding, so much of shooting, so much of everything. Like, I, I don't understand when, when you're – give him a week off. Give him a week and a half off. Give him two weeks off. Give him time to heal that bone. Don't stick him back out there and be like, oh, he'll be right. Like, that's just not, to me, a, a team that's really cares about their athletes. It's about we need to win. We need to stay in this playoff position. If he sits, then we're going to drop back too far. And that's what they're saying. And they're, like, telling this to Sabonis and most like, well, of course I'm going to play through it then. And it's just not good. Yeah, Chencha, what do you think about, like, players playing through things like that? Or, um, like, even what it's going to take for Poku's recovery at this point? Hmm. Uh, honestly, I, I don't know how you can play with a broken bone. Of course, it, it depends on how how's the the fracture. Because it, the way it occurs, it makes... The t- it was um, sorry. The way it happens, max the yep. the time it uh, it's gonna cost to the to the guy. If maybe it's only a small line that is not this place or anything, maybe he can play with that. I think uh, from Poco from Poco's perspective, I think that yeah. We don't know the exact type of fracture he had in the in the TVL plateau, but uh, as as they said, it's between six and eight weeks. But I think apart from the from the cardio and all the stuff from that you lost from not uh, being with the team, I think. Physically, he's not going to suffer yeah. anything when he's back. I think it's better, it's better to have a fracture so, than, than, a limb, than a ligament, of course. Yes, absolutely. So he'll probably, like you said, he'll need to get the cardio going back again whenever he's um, back. So in the meantime, he's probably going to be doing things like um, maybe shooting from a chair, kind of like getting, doing things that, don't require standing, right? But still, like, getting better. So um, one one player I like to mention occasionally is, like, LaMarcus Aldridge. When he was at University of Texas, he tore his ACL, and he started shooting from a chair. And he came back a much, much better shooter. Now, I know this is not going to be nearly as long, but for Poku, that time, you know, relaxing but also getting his reps in is going to be critical for him. So I'm definitely excited that, like he's going to get an opportunity to rest without it being something that seems to be indicate indicative of um, like injuries mounting, right? You know, something that could you know become a long term problem. He is only twenty one. He just turned twenty one the other day. So young body, more time for rest. And, and when you look at the Hornets, you see somebody. You're kind of like wonder what they're doing with a player like Kelly Umbre. Um, he had a bad wrist. And they play him, and he makes the wrist worse like the, the other night. So, like, I'm like, that's not – we don't like to be in that spot where we're, like, rushing people back. We can't. We, uh, look at man. It's, it's a negative look for any team that does that. Any team that treats their veterans, that treats their young players with disrespect and with, you know, like, you know what? It's, a, it's an injury, but you can play through it, right? Like, mm-hmm. nobody wants to go play for those teams. When they're older. I mean, look at the Hornets, man. I mean, Obrey's out there and he's hustling and doing all this stuff. And like, what? For what? For what? How many wins do they got? I got 10 wins. <laughs> like, why? Yeah. You know, if he's got a hurt wrist, let him sit for a couple games. Like, what the fuck's wrong with you guys? Like, this is this is basic. And this is why I love the Oklahoma City Thunder so much is because somebody like, like J-Dub gets injured. Or somebody like J-R-E gets sick. You know? Like... They don't rush these guys back. They make sure they're healthy. They make sure they're ready to go. And that way we don't lose them for six months out of the year. And that's what's so positive about what we're doing here with Poku and, and why it was it was so crucial that, like, with this injury, that we're not going to rush it. Like, somebody was asking me how long I think we're going to not have Poku for. And I'm like, 
you know, end of February, you know, like begin, um, at middle of March, like who knows and who really cares? Because the reality is they're not going to play him unless he's a hundred percent ready to go and he's game time ready. And if that's for 10 minutes, they're going to bring him back slow. I well, mean, they're going to bring him back. 10, let's imagine that 12, 14 minutes until they're to the point where he's at 20. Let's imagine that basically at two months from now, right? We're in a situation where the games no longer matter for the playoffs, right? Okay. We're, we're, we haven't been, found ourselves in that spot or like say they do matter, right? But why would you bring, why would you rush somebody back into like a playoff race, right? We could find ourselves in a situation where he's a bit like Chet's situation where he's ready, he could play, but we're just going to hold him out till next year because that's how we handle it when these players yeah. are young. And by the way, it's paying off. Why, why play a rookie more than 50 games if you don't need to? You know, like, it, it doesn't make sure. sense. You look at Josh Giddy, I think he'd be like 50-something games. You know, Shea played 50-something games last year and the year before. You know, like, Dort, same thing. Like, there's no reason for these guys to be going out there and playing balls to the wall right now. This is, this is a time for them to go out there and give it their all when they're on the court yeah. and to enjoy the rest when they're not. Because yeah. there's no, like... This is development time. This is not like a, it's it's hard to lose to a team like Charlotte. Yes, but these aren't must win now games. That's why we can sit there and watch the Charlotte game and not get pissed off that we lost to Charlotte by eight because we looked at the minute set that we played against Charlotte in the closing minutes as being very meaningful. Uh, we tied it with what three minutes to go, three minutes and forty something seconds to go in the in the uh, fourth quarter. Like yeah, she did. It. Yeah, we were in it. And and I think that's what's so important that we got to take back with it with us is that any time that we get a chance to have a good, solid game, playing solid minutes and tight games, it's good for this team for development. Like, yes, a win is always going to be great, but guess what? The last two minutes of the game, we were playing single possession games. Like, we were mm -hmm. like, we're going to balls to the wall because guess what? We don't know what's going to happen. And there's those games that we're going to be down by six or seven points with a minute and a half to go, and we're going to come back. Yeah. It's going to yeah. happen because that's how we play. Absolutely, man. And I, I want to ask you, Chencho, it was, I mean, obviously it was really nice to see Teo yeah. Maladon out there playing so well. Um, yeah. I mean, how did you feel about seeing him? And how did you feel overall? What was your takeaways mm -hmm. from the game? Uh, I mean, I like uh... I liked him, but from the first time we saw him until now, he's I think he has made he has changed a lot because he played a lot in this rookie year and looked like he could be a an okay shooter, but in the end, three years after the first season, he still hasn't hasn't reached that uh, decent level of shooting the rest yeah uh, we know he's a, he's a good playmaker and a good passer he's a nice nice going to the rim i think we have too many too many guys to to spend the time he needs to develop his abilities i think but i'm, I'm happy for him and they, they clearly need him because they don't have many Many guards besides Lamelo, so good for him. Can you hear me? Hello, guys. Can you hear me? Yeah, I mean, hello. Do you think like um, our depth is something that? Like, I hear a lot of people, when I hear the other team's announcers, they'll say, oh, the, the Thunder have too many players. Like, is that really a problem right now? It seems like we're we're having players go out at a rate where, like, everybody's getting really good minutes. So I don't know that having too many players is a problem. What do you think, Chencho? No. At this, po at, at this point, it's not a problem. Maybe we could agree that maybe never it's a problem, but... Yeah. Like we said, this is not the the NFL where injuries are more often and more serious. But even in the NBA, you can say 
that having 15 players or 16 in in this case is not is not bad for a team. Right. We have we have given minutes to everyone and a, a decent click to everyone, and we have helped him uh, everyone to to develop. And the guys that are not playing much like uh, Muscala and Omoruyi and Jalen Williams, they are and they're gonna be fresh when we need when when we need them as we as we we saw the the past game with Muscala with he scored 19 in in eight minute, in 18 minutes and of course as you said the you don't have to play the rookies too many times because you can burn them out and this that's not that's not good for anyone, not for them or for us. And this this season, the past season, and maybe the next one is going to be for development still. And that's the focus. If we lose, we lose. But we have to take care of them if we if we want to have a ten years a ten year run of success. Yeah, man, I, I, I think I think you're right there. And, and I think that as, as time goes on, we're going to see more Baisley. We're obviously going to see some more guys from the G League starting to play in here because we, we got to figure out what how are we going to make up for Poku right now? You know, like Poku is, is so much of what this team is and who this who this who the, the, the identity to this team is. And I, I, I keep on looking at, at the possibilities of, of who can step up in these, these positions. And I, and I love the fact, and I'm bringing back to what you said earlier, Mark, the fact that Coach decided to go with Jay Will here in this position. Um, he didn't score any points, but, man, 10 rebounds, one assist, one block, two offensive rebounds. I, I felt like this was a, a drew, really good charge. Good, yeah, mm-hmm. drew a charge. I thought this was a really good job. He was the only guy that got a block shot for us this year, um, last night. You know, I've never seen this team get beat in blocks, by the way, by 10-plus blocks. But last night, we got beat by 10 blocks. Uh, they had 11 blocks. We had one. And, I mean, that's the difference in the game right there. I mean, we, we're up by eight points at the end of the game if, if we didn't get blocked uh, 11 times. And, you know, we, we can take in and, and pull in so many different ways and, and different things. But I cannot wait to see Darius Baisley on that, in that center position. He's going to do some great things and really step up for Poku. Um, I I think uh, my buddy Blake, uh, he was saying, um, you know, something about Omorari coming up and stepping up and being that next person. But I, to me, it's it's the rebirth of Baisley that I really want to see here. I want to see Baisley step up and do something special and really become uh, that player that both Mark, Mark, me, and Chencho, we all believe that he can be for us. And – I just I love the fact that Baisley is a special player like that, and I want to see him out there. I want to see him with these guys and see what he can do um, at that center position. Yeah, he's a small at that center position, but he creates a huge mismatch when he drives that hole um, and the center's uh, guarding him. So, I mean, I'm all for it. Yeah, I want to see him get out there and play more. But I hope, I just I've noticed sometimes that the burst he gives when he's running on offense is quite a bit more intense than the burst he gets to give, get back on defense. And I think coach is trying to bring that out of him. And I think that's why sometimes he has like just a, a quick trigger to pull him out of the game. Um, and I think people have to understand that if Basil had gone to college, he would have had a coach screaming at him. Right. Mm-hmm. And he didn't have that experience. Right. Like yeah. you don't get away with not running hard up and down the court. And I think you get to the NBA start out with one coach, you change coaches. Like we've seen this affect players. Now the question is, what is he going to do with it? And I feel like the fact that they're still giving him, like teaching him lessons right now says to me, they haven't given up on him. They're still working with him. And I think sometimes people look at it and they're like, wow, that, that indicates he's on his way out. And I would say it does. If he doesn't learn from it, right. If he learns from it, then it could just be an indication that he's going to be, you know, around for longer though, but it's going to take a requirement of him learning from it and then him taking a deal that's 
you know, team friendly in a way that rewards both the player and the organization for the investment in the hard work they put in. But hmm. like, we're still a little bit away with Baisley. I, it was definitely to me, like the glaring thing, right? Like Baisley should be out there. And it felt like he felt like that too. When it was like, but what are you going to do about it? Because they're asking you to do something right. That they don't feel like you're getting done. Yeah. And I don't know what it is, but I have, I have my guesses. So I, we're all hopeful. We're incredibly optimistic because you don't get a group of young players and give up on them early and learn anything. Mm -hmm. You have to be patient. People are going to take their own timeline. And I'm, I'm good with being patient with Baisley. And obviously the coaching staff is too. Now let's talk a little bit about our rookies. Cause I don't know that we got a chance to last time with you, Chencho. Um, obviously the Chet injury right before the season was devastating. Um, but what we've seen from J-Dub has really exceeded my expectations. And I would say I had extremely high expectations because I fell in love with him in the draft process. Like I've said a few times before, at first I started looking at him because it's a wingspan. But by the end, I was like, this guy has massive skills. So how do you feel about J-Dub's progress now that we're, we're not quite there? You know, we're not halfway yet. Or, I mean, but we're getting close. So, I mean, we'll, we'll call around halfway. What do you think about him so far? Uh, I think at this moment, I don't know if he's right now in the in the all in the second all rookie team, but he has the the potential to do it. Well, I don't know where where can his he where is his actual position in the. I think he's a forward, so he has more chances, but. The consistency he's he's showing and he's developing in, in this part of the season is it's very promising. As just before, he has he has had like the last ten games scoring more than yeah ten points or something like that. I think he's amazing. He's uh, sorry I. I have I I have some problems of audio. Sorry. Uh, I think he's so intelligent, so smart uh, with the with the ball. He plays like a like a veteran. It's a cliche. Yeah, no problem. Right now. Man. It's a cliche right now, but I think he he has a a brain like he has played like uh, maybe three or four years. Uh, yeah, no. Develop. I think he's right. I think with, with J-Dub right now, a lot of things are going right. And I think the thing is that we have to keep on considering with J-Dub is, like, it takes him 40 or 50 games in order to get truly understanding what's going on. So we'll pass it back to Tentra here. He's back, it sounds like. Yeah. Hello, guys. Do you hear me now? We got you, man. Hey, like yes. I was saying yep. that that he's playing like he has a brain from a three or four, three or four year player. He's really smart with the ball. He he's very smart with the timing of the yeah, when he cuts sure. and what shots he takes. And he's recently he's taken more like fadeaways and midis like like Shea and has shown like he can make it so. I think it's too soon to to put yeah. a lot of pressure or to name him like the starting forward, but he plays like a, like he can be a starting someday, and he could be a, not maybe all star. He could be, but at least a decent player and average like a 15, like a 20, more than 20 point per game. Okay. Yeah. Well, I mean, like you mentioned, like his ability to hit those mid range, those runners, um, kind of funky angles. Then his athleticism is starting to come out as elite to me. Like the way he uses it, the dunks he's been putting down. Um, and this kind of comes back 
circling back to what we were saying about Trey Mann, where like if you have people with that level of athleticism and they can attack on the perimeter, like that's pretty incredible. Like I don't know of a lot of teams that have the like usually a player who can attack the rim that well is has a liability on the perimeter. Like it's like they have a weakness and it's like for some reason we keep getting these guys that are like three level scorers with elite athleticism and it's like how are how's everybody else overlooking these people? Maybe we're developing them. I don't know. What do you think, Tiff? Well, I, I think it's kind of a mix. If, if you look at what we're we're looking at, it's, it's kind of like how Mark and I look at these young men. Is we're looking at the best version of them. I think that's the thing that's it's it's the most important when you're drafting young players. Is that if you're drafting a player for how they're playing at that exact time in their life, it's one thing. But you can see Sam Presti's not doing that. Sam Presti's on a whole new level of drafting these players. I think he's looking at them like the best version of themselves, like Trey Mann. You can see the glimpses in Florida of what he's doing in the NBA, but it's just glimpses, you know? Like, there's nothing like, it's like, whoa, whoa, whoa. And it's like, okay, what he can do in the NBA is, is, is spectacular. He had 17 points, but he was one for nine on three-pointers, guys. You know, like, his shooting game wasn't there, but he was able to attack the hole in so many different ways. It was just spectacular. And I think that's what we're talking about with this team is that, like, People are going to say, why didn't this player play this game? And why didn't this player play this game? And I think it has everything to do with matchup. Coach D understands that having a bench like he does, it puts him in a very um, elite company as far as deep teams in the NBA and how to use and and, and um, really maximize each of the player's value. And when you're playing against teams that, that are big and tall, you're not going to want to play Darius Baisley all the time at that center position, you know, because like you said, and I hate even saying it, but sometimes Darius Baisley's lack of effort on defense is something that's glaring, especially for a defensive minded coach like coach D. So you're looking at this and you're starting to understand really what the values are that coach D is looking for in, in particular games. And this goes back to who is scouting for these games, who is helping coach D make these decisions because this is next level um, shit. I've never seen a, a team be able to morph what they have and the powers they use per team that they play. It, it, this has never been something that we've ever seen. I mean, we see it in the NFL. We see we see it in baseball. If you have like a left-handed pitcher, you're going to pitch your lineup. That's going to be good against them. This is very similar to how this team is being run is I think you're just taking guys that you think are going to be the best matchup against other guys. And yes, there's going to have guys that are going to be a surprise like Omorari uh, a couple games ago where he put up a ton of points and tons of rebounds. Like you're going to get those guys, but you're giving them chances to do so. You're giving them four or five minute spurts here. Okay. They didn't do anything. That's okay. Not a problem. That's okay. There's no pressure, but if they go out there and they dominate, they get more minutes. It's all about the matchups. It's all about how these guys can go out there and help the team at that very moment. And it's it's really interesting. And Coach C is never, not always going to get it right, but he's been right a lot of times when we're playing against uh, the teams that we're playing against and understanding their weaknesses and understanding uh, where we want to go at them at, on the defensive end. And we're watching different types of um, um, zones being played out there by this team. Um, it's really spectacular, man. Like, it's all next level shit that you want to see from a very young coach understanding that he's going to take five or six more years to perfect his coaching style. But this is where we're at, man. This is what we want from him. We want to see this type of growth. We want to see this type of um, understanding of the game and playing certain players against guys because it's the matchup that he's looking for. And I, I just love it, man. I, I, I got to say, I got to tip my hat. Like I get it. Some people aren't going to agree with what I'm saying here, but not playing Baisley there's two ways of looking at it. You can say he didn't utilize an asset there. Yes, I understand that. That's one way of looking at it. Another way is he didn't utilize an asset because of certain reasons. And trusting coach knows what those reasons are more so than I do and you do is the key to the to understanding success here with the Oklahoma City Thunder because we're not going to always make it. We're not going to always understand it. We're not always going to get it right. But if you follow the line, and you follow understanding what Coach D and, and Sam Presti and all these guys are trying to do, man, it's it's spectacular. And you can't help but just take a step back and just really appreciate what's happening. Yeah, I would I would love to see with um Amarui, like him getting some more time. It you know, I'm gonna say this and then we'll close it out, all right? But send it over to Chencho after. But here we go. So 
When I was at an Auburn football game, Auburn and Georgia, Charles Barkley walked past me one time, right? And there's people who are really tall and they're imposing and they, and there are people who are like not necessarily taller than you or a lot taller than you. Right. But they're just so much like wider and not in like a chunky way. Just this guy like has so like length versus girth, right? Girth. Right. Yeah. He had really, really wide shoulders, right? Incredibly wide shoulders. And so I just think that's what I see with Amarui. I see a player mm. who has the ability to take up space. And, yeah, like, I, I kind of have to lean with with Blake a little bit. Of course, we lost the game, so we're trying to, like, you know, explain why we lost, right? And, yeah, like, maybe the counter to someone who's taking up as much size as Mark Williams was was to throw, like, an Amarui out there to take up the different type of space. I don't know, man. I mean, of course, if Mark... Williams got the ball. He was probably going to score on him, but they could offensive rebound sell. But then again, who knows? I don't know, dude. What do you What do you think, Dave? Yeah, I, this is the game that we want to see Poku play thirty minutes. Man, <laughs> it hurts because mm. I love Poku. I miss him. I'm going to miss watching these games because, um, you know, one thing that Mark hated was that, uh, that I did. Uh, when we were together in Lake Erie was <laughs> I made him watch an entire, like, what, three minutes of just watching Poku run around. Bro, um, you would have done way longer than that if I had let you. Your, the words was, you said was, I wanted, do nothing else but watch Poku. And I was like, I can't do this, dude. I can't but do this. but in the madness, sometimes you see it. And, and then you see Joka out there, right, man? And he does these crazy passes and these crazy jump shots and these crazy layups and these crazy things. And you're like, see, that's what I'm talking about. I mean, yes, he'll never be 250 pounds, but the way that he plays the game and the fluid uh, fluidity of the game within him is truly spectacular with Joka. And then you look at you look at Poku and you're like, see, I can see that same type of player that dominates the game inside of himself like inside of the game he's dominating the game and everybody's like whoa like listen jokic would have never won an mvp never won an mvp much less two mvps if he wasn't dominating the way he was dominating beforehand like he was dominating before he was dominating like this in his early 20s you know and i look at this and i say okay poku's going to be that next great great big man from you know, a small, small country, a small, small city, a small, small, whatever. Like he can do things that people are going to take a best, take a step back and be like, the longevity of this young man is proof that he's one of the NBA's best players at this position. And I, I can't help but wonder in, in 10 years when he's 31 years old, you know, I can't help but wonder how many records he's going to hold of the Oklahoma City Thunder because he's special. And so when I'm watching these games, I'm not going to be watching Poku, and it's going to be depressing, and it's going to be sad. <laughs> but I'll find another guy to chase around and watch around the entire court. Um, but, yeah, man, I, that's that's what I'm going to take back is, like, th this game was, was fun to watch. I enjoyed it immensely. We had a lot of good minutes in there. That second quarter was amazing to watch. Um, but – it just without Poku, I just it hurt, man. There was something kind of burned about it, you know, and it was just kind of bitter because I kept on being like, "Man, we're so close to having that," you know, and I don't know, man. Well, at this point, it's all about plugging holes, and you know how much we like plugging holes. <laughs> um, Fine so size Poku, he's a long skinny hole we got to plug, and we'll probably do it with uh, some girth. I don't know, we'll figure it out, but yeah. it's going to be figure. all hands on deck. It's going to be everybody's got to figure out what they're doing. Um, so, all right. Look. All hands on deck. After you talk about girth, it was great, man. That was a good one. Team effort. Everybody play your part. All right. Here's what I want to say, man. Thank you. Thank you to everybody for joining us. Um, yes. Thank you, Chencho, for joining us. Thank you, Chencho. You got disconnected there. Uh, we feel awful. Yeah. But I man, mean, we this obviously um we're hoping we got Nichencho's mom too. 
We Chencho's we mom popped meet. on yeah. before. That was right really great before. to see Chencho's mom. That was awesome. Yeah, and it was uh, you know, a great time to to have. And Chencho, we're gonna have you back ASAP because we're gonna figure out whatever. We had it seemed like we had a bit of a delay all all, all the time. So um, we'll, we'll clean that up. Like we are committed to you, Chencho. We are committed to every listener. We love you. We've we've been Seriously. doing this for. Two years so long now that you're a part of our family. You know what I mean? Like yeah. Dave and I were talking right before we started talking to Chencho and I was like, like Dave and I talk almost every day now or for a while we were. And now when we don't talk, it feels like something's missing. And I feel like that with all of our, you know, friends that we've made through the years of doing this. And mm-hmm. I feel like, like the only word I can think of to help describe the, the feeling I get is family. Like nothing else really, you know, does that. So thank you for being a part of our family. Everybody take a moment, pat yourself on the back because that means you're a badass. So thank you to all the badasses. Happy New Year, guys. Also, (laughs) because next time that we will be here, it'll be 2023. So happy New Year. Enjoy it. Be responsible. Have a lot of fucking good times, if you know what I mean. But be responsible. Don't be dumbass. Yeah, and don't. Don't stay sober. (laughs) We love you. We will see you soon.